All right. Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning, Grace Church. It is good to be with you. Listen, if you are in this room or you are with us online, we're going to go ahead and stand and invite the Lord into this space. So church, will you pray with me? Jesus, we invite you into this house. God, we ask that you would come and do what you want to do. Father, we give you glory. We give you praise. Jesus, would you change us from the inside out and make us look more like you? So Jesus, we worship you, we adore you, and everybody said, amen. Come on, church, let's worship. good to be with you this morning, church. Um, kind of want to give you some vision for our set this morning. Um, we're about to go into a song called Make Room, and then after that, it's called Lord Send Revival. The theme of our set is kind of set around 
making way and inviting the Lord to come replace some of the things that maybe we need to give to him. So that's the heart of our set. But this morning, I actually want to challenge you in how we worship this morning. I want to read you something. It's from Luke 19. It says, uh, verse 38, blessings on the king who comes in in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, this is Jesus saying this, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. So this morning, got me a little something, something, <laughs> polished it up nice for you guys. It's a handy dandy stone. And I wanna challenge you this morning, just as it said that the stones would break out in cheers. If we choose not to pray, to praise God, this stone will give praise to the king. So I wanna challenge you this morning, I'm gonna put this on the floor. Don't let this stone out worship you. And, I, and, and I'm not, it's not mean, it's this, but our, we were made to praise him. And so we get the opportunity to come here and worship him. So it's just a nice little nudge and a little reminder, don't let this rock out praise you. Is that okay, church? Okay, cool. Church, will you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, we welcome you into this space. Father, come and have your way. King of glory, we prepare the way for you to come and do what you want to do. Jesus, we ask that you would bring revival into our hearts, God, revival into our lives. Jesus, we make room for you to come and do what you want to do. So Jesus, have your way. Come and have your way. We give you praise in your name. Listen, here's where.
Peace like a river wash over me. Immerse me in water as deep as the sea. Hide me in love, your healing and praise. Peace. 
just like a river washes over me. Let's worship Your Majesty. Worship Your holy name, Jesus, my everything. Church, sing it out. Lord, send the fire. Lord, send it now. Move of your spirit, heaven break. Come now, power. Cover this land. You've done it before. Lord, send the fire. Lord, send it now. Move your spirit.
Jesus, God, we make space for you to come and do what you want to do. Jesus, Lord, send revival. Would you change the things inside me? And God, would you make us more look like you? Make us look more like you. God, we give you praise. We worship you. We celebrate you. So come and have your way. And everybody said, amen. All right, church, well, we are going to move into the next part of our service, which is called community time. So what I want you to do is to turn around to the people around you. If you see someone you don't know, maybe introduce yourself, but uh, maybe ask them a weird question. Yeah, give them a high five. And uh, yeah, let's start talking, okay?
Good morning, Grace family. We're going to continue with our heart of worship and move into a time of tithes and offering. If you have any questions on what it is to give or what it looks like, or even the biblical backing behind it, there's a little pamphlet in your seat back that you can take a look at, read through, even take home with you to have more information on that. But let's pray over our tithes and offering. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. And God, we ask um, that we would give as a, a grateful heart, giving unto you. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would take our finances in your hand, Lord God, that you would bless them, but you would also take what we can give and you would multiply it and you would push it to reach your kingdom, Lord God, um, and to just love people well. So thank you so much, Jesus, for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we have a lot going on as we head into fall here at Grace. Starting on October 1st, our fall life group signups open. We encourage you to sign up, to participate, to if you're willing to lead a life group this fall. It's the best way to do life with one another here at Grace. Now, on October 12th, we're having another listening prayer night here at the church. I don't need to explain how busy and chaotic and fast-paced life can be on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we implement these listening prayer nights so we can come together and we can take time to listen, to contemplate what God is doing in our lives. It's really a special time. We would love to see you here. Now, the following night, we also have one of our courageous conversations. It's not happening here at the church. It's happening at Christ the King Bible Fellowship. This is a time where we come together with other churches in our community, and we talk about race and reconciliation and what we can do as members of the kingdom of heaven. That is going to be awesome. I'm very, very excited for those events. I'm excited to see you guys there. So these are some things that we care about deeply as Grace Church and being in unity, hearing the voice of God, spending time in his presence and seeking the welfare of the earth. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Can you imagine? The Bible's got stuff to say about those things. Well, if I have not met you yet, my name is Kari. I am one of the pastors on staff here at Grace, and I'm really excited to get into the word today. Amen? It's going to be good. We are in the final week of your blessed. If you've been around with us for the last couple of months, this has been a series that we've been going through on the Beatitudes. Those are these statements from Jesus talking about the kind of people who are blessed in this world, in his kingdom. And all of it is so counterintuitive to us, but that's just how the kingdom of God is, isn't it? It's upside down. It's backward. But the way of God may be different than us, but it brings us into life. And this is our last week where we move beyond the initial Beatitudes into that next section of Scripture. And as we've talked about in the last few weeks, you know, when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus is not talking about a whole bunch of different kinds of people. Like that person is blessed, that person is blessed, not that person, but that person for sure. That's definitely how I always received it when I had read it in scripture. But what we've come to find is that really Jesus is describing one kind of person. And that is the person who is, follows Christ and becomes a disciple in the kingdom of God. That every one of us, if we follow Jesus, accept him as Savior, implement his teachings and his way of life on this earth, we become these kind of people who are poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, and even persecuted. It's not the most exciting list if you really try to implement it into your life. But there is a power in the word of God. There is a power in his truth that, is, that we can receive in our lives. And the next section of scripture is a part that we don't always preach with the Beatitudes. In fact, I'm very familiar with this section of scripture, and I did not really realize that it's connected. It's one immediately after the other. It's a part of scripture that there are millions of sermons on. If you... Google this thing, you will find lots of cute t-shirts and coffee mugs. But it's something that 
applies directly to what we've been learning in the last couple of months. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says, you are the salt and light of the earth. Or I'm sorry, you are the salt of the earth. I'm getting ahead of myself. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. These two things totally connect. And we're going to explore a bit about that. But before we do that, can we pray? Lord God, we love you so much. God, thank you for our time in worship today where we got to glorify your name and lift you up. Lord, you, we want to make room for you today. God, I pray that my words would be totally filtered out and your words would shine through. Lord, your message would come through. Lord, would you silence any voice that is not yours in Jesus' name? God, I pray that you would protect this place for us in person and online. And God, I pray that we would encounter the life-changing power of God today together. Lord, we love you and we surrender to you. Lord God, send revival. We want your name to be glorified. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, when I was, um, you know, my husband and I, Elisha, we moved here to Federal Way three years ago, which it's crazy to realize that it's been three years because everything has been, I don't know, mushy in my brain for a long time. But we're the kind of people that when we move to a place, like, we want to make that our hometown. We didn't move from all that far away, but like now, like we're federal way people. You cut us, we will bleed fed, you know? I love being that kind of person because here's the thing. You can sometimes change where you live, but many times you can't. You're kind of stuck where you are. So instead of hating the place that you live, how about you learn to love the place that you live and you're going to have a lot more delight in your life. And there's a lot of things to delight about it wherever you are. And that started in me when I was 13. My family moved. Many of you know from it. I talk about it all the time because it was a cha- life-changing time in my life. We moved from Bonnie Lake to a rural town, a uh, small town on the coast. Still western Washington, not super far away, but it felt like a world apart. And it was not a place that a lot of people liked. Lots of people despised it, including the people who lived there. But I was like, listen, if God put me here, I'm about to go through my high school years. And if I have learned anything from TVs and movie, this is going to be my favorite time of my life. So I might as well like where I live. So I was like, I'm all in. I want to be a local, you know, like I want to like get in here and learn what life is like. It was totally different from where I was from. But I was like, I'm going to do this thing. And I found very quickly, though, because, you know, Bonnie Lake's not that big. But you were like meeting new people all the time. It wasn't like you saw people you knew around town all the time. But here, everywhere you went, everybody knew each other. And I didn't fully get that because I thought, I'm a 13-year-old girl. Like, I can dress however I want. I can go in wherever I want. Nobody's going to know that I'm new in town. Everybody knew I was new in town. Everywhere I went, I would walk into a place and people would immediately be like, where are you from, young lady? When I would hang out with my friends, I would introduce myself. They'd be like, where are you from? And I'd say, oh, I just lived down the road. They're like, yeah, but you are not from here. That's obvious. And I really tried to shed that. Like, at first it was like, oh, that's funny. Like, I'm different. But at a certain point, especially in high school, you want to be like the rest of your friends. You don't want to be the one who stuck out. And it was like years and years and years of going to parties, you know, like, you know, fun, wholesome parties with your friends, 10, 11 people, and people will be like, oh, hey, great to meet all of you guys, but where are you from? They could point me out and say, you are not from here. And I would ask, like, and my friends would tease me about it. It was kind of a running joke. But, like, eventually you just, I'm like, what else do I have to do? Like, I'm in all the clubs and the youth groups, and I'm a young life leader, and I'm the school mascot, for goodness sake. What more do I have to do to be from here? And I remember, I'm not making this up, I remember talking to my best friend and just saying, like, it was her and her brother. And I said, seriously, guys, like, why, when will I not be from out of town? It's been years. And they were like, the thing is, Car, you just think differently than everybody else. Like, you come to different conclusions than other people. You just are from somewhere else. Like, you can't shake that. 
And I f accepted it, but it was the first time that I recognized that you can be fully invested in something. You can be fully present in something and be distinct from it. You can be different than it. Maybe if you're in a marriage where you guys come from different cultural backgrounds, maybe if you've got friendships like that, you can be fully there and still just be different. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, in the Bible, it's something that is required of disciples. You know, the distinctives in the salt and light, the things that make people salt and light are these things that Jesus talked about being a kingdom person. And when we look into the pictures of salt and light, they reveal, first of all, the nature of the kingdom of God. Salt and light reveal the impact of the life that we get to live and the responsibilities of the disciples as they live in this world and await the coming of the kingdom of God. You know, these pictures of salt and light, they're so common. They're so with us. I mean, like sometimes in the Bible, Jesus will use a metaphor and it feels really abstract. But we all have an understanding of what salt and light are. And so when we look at these metaphors and we try to pull out some spiritual understanding from them, it can go in a lot of different directions. And so maybe you've heard a lot of sermons on this topic over the years and there's different insights. I don't think that there's a lot extra to bring to the table, but I do think that the way that we look at it can illuminate and be prophetic for the moment that we live in today. So before we get into the spiritual aspect of what salt and light are, I do always think it's important for us to first identify what were the things that the Israelites or the people who were hearing Jesus, what are the things that they would have known without having known it. You know, like the things that like Jesus would have said salt, they would have understood something about salt that perhaps we wouldn't. What are the practical implications? Well, you know, in Jesus's day, salt was used for everything. It was a tool. Now, it was like what we use, of course, like I have salt. I have a little thing of salt that I pinch and, you know, whenever I'm whenever I'm cooking, use it as a flavoring to bring thing, you know, to enhance the flavor of your meal. And they did use it like that. But it was actually a lot more important in Jesus' day because salt was also used as a purifier. You know, when we were at the beach a few weeks ago with my kids, we ran into the ocean, and poor Royal had like a little cut on his foot when he went into the ocean. And he immediately was like, bah! what's happening to my foot? Well, why? Because the salt got into the wound. And it may have hurt, but it was also doing some purifying work inside of him. Salt was used as a purifier practically, but it was also used in purification rituals with, um, with the Jewish people when they were offering sacrifices to God. Before Jesus, the only way that our sins could be forgiven was through offering sacrifices. Salt was an important tool in that. So salt represented purity. Without refrigeration, without freezers, Keeping meat around was a big deal. Meat, you know, it gets stinky and rotten and all that kind of stuff. And if you can't refrigerate it, if you can't freeze it, what they did is they would put a huge amount of salt on that meat and it would slow the decay of the meat. It would preserve it. If you didn't have salt, say that you went hunting but there was no salt, it wasn't going to do your family much good because you would have had to eat it right then to be able to protect it or to keep it. And salt was also used as a fertilizer. They would take the salt and they'd put it into the soil to help um, enrich the soil so that the crops that came afterward would be larger and richer and better. It was one of those, it wasn't just used for one thing, it was used for many things. And Jesus wasn't the only one who said salt was important. He wasn't the first one to point it out to people. You know, there's not a lot of writings from around the time of Jesus. I mean, there are more than other times in history but what we have always is so important. In the first century Roman naturalist, Pliny the Elder once said, nothing is more useful than salt and sunshine. Nothing is more useful than salt and such sunshine. What is that? Salt and light. Nothing is more useful than these two things. This was not just what Jesus was saying. This was an understood part of life. Now, it's funny because I love it. You know, it says, you're the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? I don't know about you guys. When I have always read this scripture, I've thought, you're the salt of the earth. I'd be like, interesting. And if salt loses its saltiness, I'd be like, what a weird thing to say, Jesus. <laughs> 
If Kari loses her Kariness, how can she be made Kari again? If feet lose its stinkiness, how can it become stinky again? You know, like, okay, like what's, I mean, sure, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's a great question. What's the point, Lord? But there is a point. There is a point. Salt in those days, like for us, we use salt. It's like that. It's a compound. It's sodium chloride. Common salt, it's very stable. Our type of salt cannot lose saltiness. It just is what it is. But in those days, salt was more important than it is today, but they also didn't have grocery stores. They didn't have the machines. They didn't have the access. Like, they had to access salt, but they didn't have the refining process that we have now. And so very often, especially in Jesus' area, they would get salt from the Dead Sea. And then they would go through kind of a steaming, boiling process to get the water out and then down to the salt. The problem was it very often ended up not just being salt. It ended up having clay and minerals and all sorts of things. And that was known as impure salt. It was not fully salt. It had all sorts of other mixtures inside of it. And when that happened, it was a waste. Think of all the work it would take for you to get that salt. All the, all the money maybe you had spent on that salt. And then when you get it home and you recognize it's not even salty. <laughs> it's not even going to do the thing that I want it to do. It was so frustrating. So literally, I mean, Jesus was being literal when he says it was just used for gravel. Instead of gravel, they would take that salt, all that work that they had done, and they put it out on paths, and it would, use, it would be used kind of like gravel now, kind of crunching on your feet to show the path, to keep you stable. But it was good for nothing. It couldn't be used for anything that it was meant for. So knowing that, what are the spiritual implications? Why does that matter? Well, if we are, as followers of Jesus, if we are the salt of the earth, then that means that God has a purpose for us. He wants to use us. We are useful. He, the life that Jesus has given us, cleans and purifies a wounded world. Do you realize that? That when he says, you are the salt of the earth, that means that our world that is broken and bleeding and could become infected and hurting, Jesus says, I want to put you into that place to bring some purification. I want to bring you into this place to help bring healing. When Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, in the same way that, sl- that salt slows decay in meat, He uses us to stop the spread of corruption and decay in our world. That we are the salt of the earth, which means that we bring out the flavor, the best in others. I love that we serve a God who wants us to make the best things in life taste better. Right? That the relationships that we have, the most perfect things that we find in this world, the delight that we have because of the spirit of God in us, we get to make that thing better. And we also get to come alongside others and say, what is the best that God has for you? I want to help see that thing happen, right? Have you ever had somebody do that for you? I've had people do that for me. I've gotten to do that for others. Just to walk alongside them and say, you know what? This will not benefit me at all but I know that part of my purpose on this earth is to make you shine, to help you where you're weak, to love you where you're unlovable. The love of God gets to move in that moment and people become transformed into the best version of themselves, not for success purposes, but because it glorifies God. And we, when we do that, we help to create thirst in others. That's what salt does. It helps to create thirst in others. And what, who are blessed? those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And even when we're at our lowest low, and we feel like we've been pushed into the dirt, God makes us a fertilizer for the crops to come. The thing is, is that there are not a lot of churches in the world, or there's a lot of churches in the world, but it's not so many that get to exist for decades and for generations. Grace Church has a legacy. Do you know that? Some of you are brand new here to Grace Church, and I want you to know that the beauty that you see God doing here in this place, a big part of it is because of those who have invested in the soil before us. And some of you in this room have been some of those people, and we thank you. Because God will make the soil richer and richer with the salt of the earth so that the future generations can thrive. 
But if the salt loses its saltiness, what is it good for? You know, when I look at the Greek, when I look at the Greek for loses its saltiness, those three words just kind of come down to one word. It's pronounced something like moreno, and it means to be made foolish, to show foolishness, to become saltless, tasteless, inert. If we allow ourselves as followers of Christ to become so filled and combined with things that are not God, if we resist the refining process that God wants to put us through, the impurities in us will make us tasteless. And when you have something so powerful as purpose, if your salt loses its saltiness, what is it good for? You know, the, the sad truth, and I don't want, usually like to preach like this, but this is the word of God. The truth is, is that there are people who you will see and you will say, that is a disciple of Christ. They seem like a disciple of Christ. They're super salty. Don't you see the crust on the outside? Right? But when you're cut open, when you're, when you're spending time before God, you see that it, it's a false facade. You have not been marinated in the salt of God. It has not gotten into you. You have not been transformed. And that terrifies me. Absolutely terrifies me. As a person in ministry, as a Christian, as a wife and a mom, as a pastor, it terrifies me to think that I could look salty for all the world and even have salt around me but not be transformed by the power of God. True disciples don't lose their essence. And all of us have the opportunity to be those types of true disciples. But there is a price associated with it. He paid the price for us to know him, but we pay the price in our discipleship walk. Salt, remember, is both distinctive from the world and yet fully involved in it. Moving on to light, verse 14. It says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and give it light, to, give its light to everyone in the house. Then in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, salt on its own is this profound picture and light on its own is this profound picture, but when you put them together, you start to see a commonality between the two. And so before we dive into more about light, I have to point out that salt and light are both pictures of bringing order to disorder. Salt and light are both pictures of bringing order into disorder. You know, we take light for granted, don't we? Like, we just have it. I've got a lot of lights on me right now, right? Like, light is everywhere. But if you've ever been in a place where there's no electricity, that it's totally lit by candlelight, you start to realize how enveloping and deep the darkness is, don't you? I remember when I was in um, YWAM, I spent a couple months in Thailand and Laos, and we had a few, a few different times that we were in these kind of like hill villages. And one night we had just rolled into town, and it was um, this remote village. It was awesome. Incredible hospitality from the people who welcomed us, but I, I think we got there a little bit late. I remember our leaders saying to us, like, okay, guys, we're going to settle in, and then we're going to, you know, have some time of worship and prayer, and, you know, and then we'll go to bed a little bit later. But as we sat down, the host there said, by the way, guys, the electricity is going out in about 10 minutes. And we were like, what? <laughs> Tell us more about that. And we realized there was no electricity at night. And so as we're preparing, to like do all of this stuff, our leaders were like, okay, guys, well, I guess we're going to sleep right now because there's no electricity. We did not come prepared. And when the lights went out, I remember feeling like, I can remember standing on the stairs and looking up and the intensity of the darkness around me. Like you couldn't see your hand right here because it wasn't like it was just like dark in that house. It was dark for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. The stars were amazing. But you get into this, into this home, and we're all sleeping together on this, you know, this raised bamboo mat, and it was comfortable, but you're, like, holding on to the person next to you because you have this realization, I have no power. I have no ability 
I, if I go to the bathroom, what's going to happen, <laughs> right? Because you, you're not familiar with the area. The darkness is enveloping in a way that we just don't understand here. I look out my window, there, I can see lights in the distance. I need to go to the bathroom, I turn on the light. When there's no light, you realize the power that darkness has over you. And we see that throughout the Hebrew scriptures and Hebrew poetry. Darkness, especially in the Old Testament, was a symbol of power and dread. Because there was not the access. Once the light, once the sun was down, anything went if you were not protected. And so practically, when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, and then he says, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden, these towns on hills were so important to them. If they were traveling in the evening, they could look up at Jerusalem, and they could see all these little tiny thing, you know, flickers of light in these windows or on the wall. And so when you could not see anything, you could just keep heading toward that place and it would protect you from going off or being potentially hurt in the darkness. Jerusalem wasn't the only city like that. There were others. It served an important purpose. And how were these cities lit up? They were lit up through lamps and candlelight. Jesus specifies the kind of light that we are. He says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So we have a picture of these kind of lamps. Because we say lamp and it's a little bit different than what you might think. These were lamps. And this circular part in the middle where there's the hole, that's where you would put in some oil. Maybe olive oil, just a few you know, tablespoons of olive oil into there. And then that little spout there, you'd put in just a little wick and it would kind of float on the oil and you would light it. And that was the light that you had for your home. Now, this kind of light was not, I mean, if you've lit just one candle before, you know how well that's going to light up an entire room. Homes were just one room. So you just have this one little lamp flickering at night. And so what people would do is they would take it and they put it up into a niche in their wall, higher up than everyone else, so you're not touching it, and they would leave it on all night long because having light in your house protected you from predators or those who might want to hurt you. And so these homes, this city on a hill, were all lit by like one flickering light. Maybe if you were rich, you had more than one. But for the most part, just one. So what are the spiritual implications for this? Well, I mean, I will say, first of all, we have to remember that these types of lamps only are lit because the oil is there. And so for us, as followers of Jesus, we provide the oil of our lives so that God can come and light it. It's not in our works, but it is in our presence. Saying, God, fill me with your light Lighted lamps are me mentioned all throughout the Bible in really interesting ways. I won't go deeply into it, but it's, it's so worth the study. In Psalm 119, a lighted lamp is considered to be God's word. In 2 Samuel, we see that it's God's guidance. In Isaiah, it's the salvation, that lighted lamps are, symbolize salvation. We see in Proverbs that it can be the human spirit and outward prosperity. In 1 Kings, it can be a son as a successor. And of course, Jesus himself in John 9, 5 says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You know, church, it can be confusing because Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And then he also says, you are the light of the world. So who's the light of the world? Well, it's him. But we are not, it's important what kind of light we are because we are not the sun and the stars. A candle or a lamp cannot light itself. It can only hold light. We cannot light ourselves. We are not our own light. He comes and lights us. And then because of that, we have the opportunity to partner with him. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He shines his light to everyone. That Greek word for everyone means everyone, whole always. Whole is in whole and complete. Everyone whole, always. This is a concept that is bigger than us. 
But the idea is that we have to be in the presence of others for them to see our light. We have to be in the presence of others. Church, can I ask you, do you bring your light into the darkness? Or do you huddle around with other lamps and say, man, that's a bad dark night out there? Because that's what I kind of think the church does for the most part, if I'm going to be honest. We light together, and that's good. But God has created us to be light in dark places. He's created us to be both distinctive from the world and fully in it. Church, light floods into a dark closet. If you're in a dark closet and the door is closed, even the smallest amount of light is going to come in. And somewhere along the way, the enemy has convinced us that the dark has become too dark for the light. The enemy has convinced us that things have gotten so dark that there's nothing that we can do about it. But that's not how light works. It's not how light works. We can see the stars traveling how many billions of miles because light cannot be stopped. So what does this mean? Well, church, at its simplest, this means that Christians are meant to be visible. Secret discipleship is not biblical. Secretly following Jesus has nothing to do with what he has called us to do. He made us to be visible, to be lights. And I will say, it, I know, like I know, I know, I know. This is scary. This is really scary. When you start to walk it out in your life, when you start to walk it out in your workplace or in your family, in your friends, in your school, wherever you are, and you start to be known as somebody who is a follower of Jesus, when you start to be letting your light be known, the thing is when you walk into a dark room, some people will absolutely be annoyed with you because maybe their eyes aren't adjusted to the light yet. And honestly, and I think this is the biggest thing, light exposes things that haven't been seen. And so there are things in a dark room, and maybe you know that about your own heart. There are things that have not been touched by the light for a long time. And the idea that those are going to be seen are terrifying. But you cannot let that stop you. God has not called you to be a wet blanket in the world. Church, you're going to reveal things when you walk into dark rooms, but you're also going to liberate the oppressed. Consider that. There are some people, and maybe you are one of these people or you have been here, who have felt like they are locked in a dark room. Nobody sees them, and you are being abused. You are being oppressed. You are forgotten. But when the light comes in, you say, finally. Now, the person who maybe is doing that work is not going to be thrilled. But, the, but God and what God wants to do, he's setting people free. Wanderers get to find their way back home because you are shining your light. When you walk into your family and into your work or into your school or your neighborhood, wherever that thing might be, and you get to ask the question, how do I bring out the best in this place? What is heaven's vision for this place? You are changing the face of the earth. The enemy wants you to believe that because you are poor in spirit, because you are meek or hungering and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemaker or persecuted, the enemy wants you to think that that means that you are obnoxious or oppressive or weak or a loser. But God says that these are the very things that make us salt and light. These are the very things that make us a difference maker in our world. And so church, I want to ask you this morning, where is God asking you to shine your light? Where is God, what darkness do you see before you? What is the place that you are saying, that place is too dark for me? Because the thing is, I believe, you know, one of the, one of the oldest lies of all time is that the next generation under me, whoever me is, right, me is you, the next generation under me is the most depraved, worst generation of all time. If you read through history, everybody believed that. Like Plato literally believed that. It's something that Satan tells us. It's not something that God says. And so if somebody comes to me and says, well, do you know what they're teaching in schools? Or do you know what people are doing? Or do you know what, you know, all this and all this? It's like, yeah, sure, that may be true. But if you spend time with me, I'm never going to give you any room to talk about it. 
because I'm not going to let the enemy win. Because the same power that saved me can save anybody else. And the thing about darkness, I mean, I'm getting into it. Okay, so the thing about darkness is that we all feel very comfortable with the darkness we're acquainted with. So it's easy for us to look at other generations, maybe above us, below us, wherever, any time in history, and say, how could they live in that darkness? But we're just doing that thing where we judge others by their actions, but us by our intentions. And we say, they are deprived, but we, oh man, well in my day, we did it in good faith. They're doing it in good faith, people. Those people that are in darkness are doing it in good faith. And do you know who knows that? God. And he's already working. He's already working. He never stops working in people's lives. So if there is a darkness before you that feels too dark, too overwhelming, there are times that God's saying, I'm going to bring somebody in to turn on the light. But there are times where he says, I want you to walk closer. I want you to come closer to that person. I want you to come closer to that situation because I want you to be the light. I want you to start liberating the people who are stuck there. And I want you to become acquainted with their, with their heart, with their desires, with their intentions. Because what you see as utter darkness, I see a person trapped. What you see as darkness, I see a lamp about to be lit. But I need you to get close enough so that they know who they're supposed to be. We are the light of the world. And that means that we cannot let the darkness make us flicker. We will shine brighter and lighter for longer because it's not us who lights ourselves. It's him. I want us to be a people. When in churches, we often see there are people, whether it be because of age or circumstance, the church they're in, whatever it is, that they will shine bright for a season and then they'll pull back and say it's somebody else's turn. And they'll dim their light or they won't hold it up. They'll hold it down. But Grace Church, every single person here, we are all called. We are all chosen. Every one of us has a light to shine. And we get to be that city on a hill where on Sundays we come together and we burn bright and the world can see. But the thing is we build up faith in here so that we can have faith out there. We become healed in here so we can see healing out there. If we have a bonfire in here, that means that we got a lot of extra fire to share with those around us. You are invited. I don't just tell you, hey, you got to wake up. You got to stop dismissing the darkness. The thing is, Jesus did not despise that which he would not serve. Church, do not despise that which you will not serve. He wants to bring you into every part of your life. And it's some, for some of you, he's starting to bring things to your mind that you're like, I never thought I would go there. And for others of you, he's saying, no, I've put you in the exact right place right now. And I'm going to let you shine brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. But we all have the opportunity to step into that this morning. So church, can we pray together? Lord God, we love you so much. And Lord, I sense even as we begin to pray, Lord, that there are some people here who are saying, I am caught in darkness. I am caught in darkness. I can't be a light because I don't have a light. And Lord, I pray right now, I thank you, Lord, that you knew this moment was coming, God. You knew this moment was coming and that you wanted to bring light into a dark space. And so church, if that is you right now, if there's anybody here with our heads down, our eyes closed, if there's anybody that's saying, I need the light of Jesus in my life, can you raise your hand? We want to pray with you. Thank you, Lord. All right, we're going to pray for you right now. Lord God, I thank you. Jesus, I thank you that you are saying, I want to bring light into the darkest place. And Lord, as people surrender to you, whether it be in their hearts or with their hands, whatever that looks like, God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them right now. Lord, would you show your love and your forgiveness, and would you bring that voice of liberation and the light of clarity into this situation right now? Lord, we love you. And Lord, I also pray for the people here who are saying, 
My light has been lit, but my, I have not allowed my life, the oil of my life to show up. God, I pray that we would enter into that place. If that's you, you can just quietly say, yes, Lord, I want to show up. Lord, I pray that we would be a people surrendered to you. And Lord, I do pray that fear would fall off of us as Christians in Jesus' name. That fear would fall off of us that would say, I have to be different from the world so I can't be in it. Don't you know that if I'm in it, I'll corrupt it or it'll corrupt me? Lord, I pray for a backbone to be put into the believers in Jesus' name. Lord God, a steel backbone on our spine so that we can stand up tall. That when the enemy attacks, Lord God, you are covering us and shielding us. And Lord, I pray that you would give us ways to enter into dark places and shine your light. I just sense the Lord saying, you don't have to be weird about it. You just have to be a follower of Jesus. Father, we love you so much. We lift ourselves to you, Lord God. We want to glorify you with all we are. Lord, I pray that this church, Grace Church, would be the salt and light of the earth. Because we're just like you. Because you've made us like you. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, church. Well, I love you. If you need prayer following this, please come forward. We would love to pray with you. God bless you. Have a great day.